Good day and welcome to SEO Bricks Insight where we look at what's really going on in the world of the bricks. Now, the up and coming US presidential election is prompting renewed debate about which candidate will suit Russia's interests best. Once again, there's a temptation to view the Republican candidate Donald John Trump as a more acceptable politician for Moscow. I mean, Trump has indicated he thinks a deal with Russia over a number of issues, including the Ukraine, is a possibility. I mean, his approach as a businessman is transactional. He's committed to advancing the national interests of his country, but in his rhetoric he says he's open to negotiating mutually beneficial arrangements. Now bear in mind what any Republican says from a position of strength is of little concern in Russia as they've long been accustomed to this and are ready for the power play politics. However, those who are anticipating the United States doing deals under Trump or at least having a more constructive relationship in a realistic spirit are likely to be disappointed. It's very unlikely that the Trump factor will have a significant impact on the structure of relations between Russia and the West. I mean, in general, Moscow is not that concerned about the identity of the individual who's elected as President of the United States. That's because it's unlikely that the individual occupying the role of President will have a significant impact on Russian-American politics and relationships. I mean, Mr. Trump's victory in the 2016 election was initially met with enthusiasm in Moscow. At the time, the relationship between Russia and the United States was already facing significant challenges with the situation in Ukraine being a key point of contention. At the time, it appeared that the situation was still open to change. A year and a half prior to Trump's electoral victory, the Minsk agreements on the conflict in the Donbass came into force and the remaining elements of the arms control regimes remained in place. Trump's promise to drain the swamp and eliminate the influence of deep state bureaucrats and aiming to resolve the long-standing issues in foreign and domestic policies simultaneously were going to happen. Now before I continue, I'd like to make an appeal. If you like and enjoy my videos, you can help me fund my channel and the website seobricksinsight.com to further develop it. This can be done by making a small donation, which is what you do is just click on the thanks button at the bottom of the video screen. Everybody who donates does get a personal thank you from me and I'm thanking everybody now who's watching this video. Now Trump's elector also appear to share similar values and characteristics to him. These include a strong worth ethic, patriotism and family values. They were opposed to the cosmopolitan and atomized residents of the large metropolises who live largely in a virtual economy and work in the services sector. Even at that time, experienced russian Americanists and diplomats advised against excessive optimism. They believed that Trump's populism was unlikely to reverse the objective security trends that have been taking place. Now their assessment proved to be very accurate. The majority of Trump's presidency was characterised by the concocted lies, falsehoods and media firestorms surrounding Russia's alleged involvement in interfering in the 2016 elections with the object of influencing the outcome in the favour of eventual winner Donald Trump. I mean, he, despite avoiding impeachment over the perceived infraction, the topic of intervention hindered all diplomatic efforts in regards to Russia. In the passing of the PL 115-44 Katsa bill by Congress incorporated Barack Obama's executive orders on Ukraine and digital security into federal law. Now this action denied Trump as the president the ability to rescind them or remove individuals from sanctions lists without congressional approval. Katsa also granted the president the authority to implement a range of restrictive measures. However, the Trump administration applied sanctions judiciously, taking care to not unduly harm Americans' investors' uh, positions in Russia. I mean, the State Department's legal counsel offered a comprehensive critique of the radical initiatives proposed by Congress, specifically the draconian sanctions and the Daska bill as areas of concern. 
Concurrently, Trump was an ardent proponent of sanctions against Russian gas pipeline product projects, particularly Nord Stream 2. I mean, in order to exert pressure on Russia to exit the European gas market, he endorsed the 2019 PISA legislation and subsequently its 2020 amendments. I mean, European supply companies, particularly the Swiss firm Allseas, which had leased the pipe laying vessel, uh, were significantly discouraged by the prospect of sanctions and actually gave up working on the project. The Russians ultimately modified their own vessels for the construction purposes, and although there was a delay in building Nord Stream 2, it was completed. So in essence, Trump has demonstrated a willingness to impose sanctions in a decisive manner when he deems it appropriate and necessary for his objectives. In general, efforts to engage in dialogue with Russia have not yet yielded any tangible outcomes. Furthermore, it's evident that Trump was an active proponent of arms control regime. Despite the scandals, the American political machine continues to operate effectively and has not been influenced by the deep social divisions in American society during his presidency. Now, as the American researcher Aaron Moldavsky observed in, back in 1966, the United States has too traditionally had distinct presidential approaches to foreign and domestic policy. One doesn't interfere with the other. In other words, internal social divisions don't impact foreign policy, which just carries on as usual. I mean, any conflict between the Democratic and Republican Party is respected their internal processes and is a very much an internal thing. In the area of foreign policy, there may be slight differences, but they're not sufficient to justify a divergence of opinion. Furthermore, there's been a long-standing consensus between the Democrats and the Republicans in regards to Russia, the, the Russophobics. I mean, it's notable that following the departure of Trump from the presidency, Joe Biden's policy towards Moscow remained relatively balanced until the end of 2021. I mean, Biden refrained from imposing punitive sanctions on the pipeline projects, aligning his stance with that of Germany and the EU at the time. Then at the last minute, he gave the go-ahead for the START treaty to be extended. In 2021, he signed the Executive Order 14024, which became the primary legal instrument for sanctions against Russia. And then prior to the commencement of the special military operation, uh, uh, he employed it to a limited extent. Now, the situation began to change against the backdrop of the deteriorating relations between the two countries on European security issues and the Ukraine. I mean, this was due to structural factors rather than the role of the US president. If Trump had been in Biden's position at the end of 2021, his approach to uh, Russia would probably have been exactly the same. I mean, following the start of the military operation, Washington would have implemented sanctions against Russia regardless of the identity of the, whoever the sitting president was. I mean, the potential outcome of the 2024 elections in which Trump is a candidate is unlikely to result in any significant changes for Russia. I mean, Trump's known to be an opponent of arms control. I mean, the process of erosion has continued under the Biden administration and both Trump and Kamala Harris have the potential to drive the final nail into the coffin of uh, strategic arms control. Now, Trump will probably pursue a more active strategy to promote American energy resources in the European market, particularly given the EU's sanctions against Russia are likely to reinforce this approach. It's unlikely that Trump's threat to force European allies to pay for their security will result in a breakdown of NATO solidarity. I mean, such threats did not affect it even during his first term, and today, in the context of the crisis in relations with Russia, they're not going to have any changes, let alone <coughs> many more uh, things happening. I mean, European allies, uh, NATO allies, are increasing their military spending despite uh, Trump's rhetoric. And Trump will be unable to resolve the Ukrainian conflict unless there's certain things happen, including the, <coughs> the Ukrainians run out of men and uh, ammunition and Russia has a decisive victory. Nothing Trump can do about it, and it's probably going to happen before he actually takes power, if he wins at all. I mean, it's unlikely that uh, Trump's accession will result in the destabilisation of the American political system. It will just carry on as usual. 
I mean, the, in, and if there are internal divisions, is that they're not going to have any impact on their foreign policy. So ultimately, the result of the US elections is of no interest whatsoever to Russia and its consequences are going to be minimal. I mean, it's premature to consider this significant factor in Russia's relationship. So why does it matter who wins the European potential? Nobody cares. And Russia certainly doesn't care what the outcome is. Anyway, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, you can help me fund the channel and the website seobricksinsight.com by clicking on the thanks button and making a small donation. That's done at the bottom of the screen. Don't forget to uh, share and also comment. I love getting your comments and I'll come back to you as many comments as I possibly can. Thank you.